Okay, well, uh, we've heard a lot of people speak uh, this conference about the power of the human mind. And uh, what I'd like to do today is give you a vivid example of how that power can be unleashed when someone is in a survival situation, how the will to survive can bring that out in people. Uh, this is a, an incident which occurred on Mount Everest. It was the worst disaster in the history of Everest. Uh, and when it occurred, I was the only doctor on the mountain. So I'll take you through that and uh, we'll see what it's like uh, when someone really summons the will to survive. Okay, this is Mount Everest. It's 29,035 feet high. I've been there six times. Four times I did work with National Geographic making tectonic plate measurements. Twice I went with NASA doing uh, remote sensing devices. It was on my fourth trip to Everest that a comet passed over the mountain, uh, Hayakutaki, and these Sherpas told us then that that was a very bad omen, and we should have listened to them. Everest is an extreme environment. There's only one-third as much oxygen at the summit as there is at sea level. Near the summit, temperatures can be 40 degrees below zero. You can have winds 20 to 40 miles an hour. It's actually a wind chill factor which is lower than a summer day on Mars. And I remember one time being up near the summit, I reached into my down jacket for a drink from my water bottle inside my down jacket, only to discover that the water was already frozen solid. That gives you an idea of just how severe things are near the summit. Okay, this is the route up Everest. It's, uh, it starts at base camp uh, at 17,500 feet. Camp one, 2,000 feet higher. Camp two, another 2,000 feet higher up what's called the Western Coombe. Camp three is at the base of Lhotse, which is the fourth highest mountain in the world, but it's dwarfed by Everest. And then camp four is the highest camp. That's 3,000 feet short of the summit. This is a view of base camp. Uh, this is pitched on a glacier at 17,500 feet. It's the highest point you can bring your yaks before you have to unload. And this is what they unloaded for me. I had four yak loads of medical supplies, which were dumped in a tent, and here I am trying to arrange things. This was our expedition. It was uh, a National Geographic expedition, but it was organized by the Explorers Club. There were three other expeditions on the mountain, an American team, a New Zealand team, and an IMAX team. And after actually two months of preparation, we built our camps all the way up the mountain. This is a view looking up the ice fall, the first 2,000 feet of the climb up from base camp. And here's a picture in the ice fall. It's a waterfall, but it's frozen, but it moves very slowly, and it actually changes every day. Uh, when you're in it, you're like a rat in a maze. You can't even see over the top. This is near the top of the ice fall. You want to climb through at night when the ice is frozen. Uh, that way, it's less likely to tumble down on you. These are some climbers reaching the top of the ice fall just at sunup. This is me crossing a crevasse. Uh, we cross on aluminum ladders with safety ropes attached. There's another crevasse. Uh, some of these things are 10 stories deep or more. And one of my climbing friends says that the reason we actually climb at night is because if we ever saw the bottom of what we're climbing over, <laughs> we would never do it. Okay, this is camp one. It's the first flat spot you can reach after you get up to the top of the ice fall. And from there we climb up to camp two, which is uh, sort of in the foreground. These are climbers moving up the Lhotse face, that mountain uh, toward camp three. They're on fixed ropes here. A fall here, if we weren't roped in, would be 5,000 feet down. This is a view taken from camp three. You can see the Lhotse faces in profile. It's about a 45 degree angle. It takes two days to climb it. So you put the camp halfway through. If you notice, the summit of Everest is, is black. There's no ice over it. And that's because Everest is so high, it's in the jet stream, and winds are constantly scouring the face, so no snow gets to accumulate. What looks like a cloud behind the summit ridge is actually snow being blown off the summit. This is uh, on the way up from Camp 3 to Camp 4, moving in up through the clouds. And this is at Camp 4. Once you get to Camp 4, you have maybe 24 hours to decide if you're gonna go for the summit or not. Everybody's on oxygen, your supplies are limited, and uh, you either have to go up or go down, uh, make that decision very quickly. This is a picture of Rob Hall. He was the leader of the New Zealand team. This is a radio he used later to call his wife that I'll, I'll tell you about. 
And these are some climbers waiting to go to the summit. They're up at Camp 4, and you can see there's wind blowing off the summit. This is not good weather to climb in. So the climbers are just waiting, hoping that the wind's going to die down. And in fact, the wind does die down that night. It becomes very calm. There's no wind at all. This looks like a good chance to go for the summit. So here are some climbers starting out for the summit on what's called the triangular face. It's the first part of the climb. It's done in the dark because it's actually less steep than what comes next. And you can gain daylight hours if you do this in the dark. So that's what happened. The climbers got up on the southeast ridge. This is the view looking at the southeast ridge. The summit would be in the foreground. It's, uh, from here, it's about 1,500 feet up at a 30-degree angle to the summit. But what happened that year was the wind suddenly and unexpectedly picked up. A storm blew in that no one was anticipating. And you can see here some ferocious winds blowing snow way high off the summit. And there were climbers on that summit ridge. This is a picture of me in that area taken a year before. Uh, and you can see I've got an oxygen mask on with a rebreather. I have an oxygen hose connected here. You can see in this climber, we have two oxygen tanks in the backpack little titanium tanks, very lightweight, and we're not carrying much else. This is all you've got. You're very exposed on the summit ridge. OK, this is a view taken on the summit ridge itself. This is on the way toward the summit on that 1,500-foot ridge. All the climbers here are climbing unroped. And the reason is because the drop-off is so sheer on either side that if you were roped to somebody, you would just wind up pulling them off with you. So each person climbs individually, and it's a, it's a difficult it's not a straight path at all. It's, it's very difficult climbing. Uh, and there's always the risk of falling on either side. If you fall to your left, you're going to fall 8,000 feet into Nepal. If you fall to your right, you're going to fall 12,000 feet into Tibet. So it's probably better to fall into Tibet because you'll live longer. <laughs> <laughs> But either way, you fall for the rest of your life. <laughs> OK, those climbers were up near the summit, along that summit ridge that you see up there. And uh, I was down here in Camp 3. My expedition was down in Camp 3 uh, while these guys were up there in the storm. The storm was so fierce that we had to lay uh, fully, fully dressed, fully equipped, laid out on the tent floor to stop the tent from blowing off the mountain. It was the worst winds I've ever seen. And, uh, the climbers up on the ridge were that much higher, 2,000 feet higher, and completely exposed to the elements. We were in radio contact with some of them. This is a view taken along the summit ridge. Uh, Rob Hall, we heard by radio, was up here at this point in the storm with Doug Hansen. And we heard that Rob was OK, but Doug was too weak to come down. Uh, he was exhausted, and Rob was staying with him. We also got some bad news in the storm that uh, Beck Weathers, another climber, had collapsed in the snow and was dead. There were still 18 other climbers that we weren't uh, aware of their, uh, their condition. They were lost. Confu there was total confusion on the mountain. There were, all the stories were confusing. Most of them were conflicting. We really had no idea what was going on uh, during that storm. We were just hunkered down in our tents at Camp 3. Our two strongest climbers, Todd Burleson and Pete Athens, uh, decided to go up to try to rescue who they could, even though there was a ferocious storm going. Uh, they tried to radio a message to Rob Hall, who was a superb climber, uh, stuck sort of with a weak climber uh, up near the summit. I expected them to say to Rob, hold on, we're coming. But in fact, what they said was, leave Doug and come down yourself. There's no chance of saving him, and just try to save yourself at this point. And Rob got that message, but his, his answer was, we're both listening. Todd and Pete got up to the summit ridge up in here, and there was a scene of complete chaos up there. But they did what they could to stabilize the people. Uh, I gave them radio advice from Camp 3. And we sent down the climbers that could make it down under their own power. The ones that couldn't, uh, we just sort of decided to leave up at Camp 4. So the climbers were coming down along this route. This is taken from Camp 3, where I was. And uh, they all came by me so I could take a look at them and see what I could do for them, which is really not much, because Camp 3 is a little 
notch cut in the ice in the middle of a 45 degree angle. You can barely stand outside the tent. It's really cold, it's 24,000 feet. The only supplies I had at that altitude were uh, two plastic bags with preloaded syringes of painkiller and steroids. So as the climbers came by me, I sort of assessed whether or not they were in condition to continue on further down. Uh, the ones that weren't that lucid or were not well coordinated, I would give an injection of, of uh, steroid to try to give them some period of lucidity and, uh, and coordination where they could then work their way further down the mountain. So it's so awkward to work up there that sometimes I even gave the injections right through their clothes. It was just too hard to maneuver uh, any other way up there. While I was taking care of them, we got uh, more news about Rob Hall. There was no way we could get up high enough to rescue him. Uh, he called in to say that he was alone now. Apparently Doug had died higher up on the mountain. But Rob was now too weak to come down himself. And with the fierce winds and up at that altitude, he was just beyond rescue. And he knew it. Uh, at that point, he asked to be paged into his wife. He was carrying a radio. His wife was home in New Zealand, seven months pregnant with their first child. And Rob asked to be patched into her. That was done. And Rob and his wife had their last conversation. They picked a name for their baby. Rob then signed off, and uh, that was the last we ever heard of him. I was faced with treating a lot of critically ill patients at 24,000 feet, which was an impossibility. So what we did was we got the victims down to 21,000 feet, where it was easier for me to treat them. This was my medical kit. It's a tackle box uh, filled with medical supplies. This is, uh, this is what I carried up the mountain. I had more supplies lower down, which I asked to be brought up to meet me at the lower camp. And this was the scene at the lower camp. The survivors came in one by one. Uh, some of them were hypothermic. Uh, some of them were frostbitten. Some were both. Uh, what we did was try to warm them up as best we could, put oxygen on them, and uh, try to revive them, which is difficult to do at 21,000 feet when the tent is freezing. This is uh, some severe frostbite on the feet, severe frostbite on the nose. This climber was snow blind. Uh, as I was taking care of these climbers, we got a, a startling uh, Startling experience. Out of nowhere, Beck Weathers, who we had already been told was dead, stumbled into the tent. Just like, like a mummy, he walked into the tent. I expect him to be incoherent, but in fact, he walked in the tent and said to me, hi, Ken, where should I sit? And then he said, do you accept my health insurance? <laughs> he really said that. <laughs> So he was completely lucid, but he was very severely frostbitten. You can see his hand is completely white, his face, his nose is burned. First it turns white, and then when it's completely necrosis, it, it turns black, it just, and then it falls off. It's the last stage, just like a scar. So as I was taking care of Beck, he, he related what had been going on up there. He said he had gotten lost in the storm, collapsed in the snow, and just laid there, unable to move. Some climbers had come by and looked at him, and he heard them say, he's dead. But Beck wasn't dead. He heard that, but he was completely unable to move. He was in some sort of catatonic state where he could be aware of his surroundings, but couldn't even blink to indicate that he was alive. So the climbers passed him by. And Beck laid there for a day, a night, and another day in the snow. And then he said to himself, I don't want to die. I have a family to come back to. And the thoughts of his family, his kids and his wife, generated uh, enough energy, enough motivation in him so that he actually got up after laying in the snow that long a time. He got up and found his way back to the camp. And Beck told me that story very quietly, but I was absolutely stunned by it. I, I couldn't imagine anybody laying in the snow that long a time and then getting up. He had apparently reversed an irreversible hypothermia. And uh, I can only try to speculate on how he did it. So what if we had Beck hooked up to a spec scan, something that could actually measure brain function? 
just very simply, the three parts of the brain, the frontal lobe where you uh, focus your attention and concentration, you have the temporal lobe where you form images and keep memories, and the posterior part of your brain which contains the cerebellum which controls motion, and the uh, brain stem where you have your basic maintenance functions like heartbeat and respiration. So let's take a cut through the brain here and imagine that Beck was hooked up to a spec scan. This measures dynamic blood flow and therefore energy flow within the brain. So you have the prefrontal cortex here lighting up in, in red. This is a pretty evenly distributed scan. You have the, the middle area where the temporal lobe might be in here and the posterior portion where the uh, maintenance functions are in the back. This is a, a, a roughly normal scan showing uh, equal distribution of energy. Uh, now you go to this one and you see how much more the frontal lobes are lighting up. This might be what Beck would be experiencing when he realizes he's in danger. He's focusing all his attention on getting himself out of trouble. Uh, these parts of the brain are quieting down. He's not thinking about his family or anybody else at this point. And he's working pretty hard. He's uh, trying to get his muscles going and get out of this. Okay, but uh, he's, he's, lo he's losing ground here. He's running out of energy. He's, it's too cold, he can't keep his metabolic fires going. And you see there's no more red here. His brain is quieting down. He's collapsed in the snow here. Everything is quiet, there's very little red anywhere. Uh, Beck is powering down, he's dying. You go on to the next scan, but in Beck's case, you can see that the middle part of his brain is beginning to light up again. Uh, He's beginning to think about his family. He's beginning to have images that are motivating him to, to get up. He's developing energy in this area through thought. And this is, this is how he's going to turn thought back into, into action. This part of the brain is called the anterior cingulate gyrus. It's an area in which uh, a lot of neuroscientists believe the seat of will exists. This is where people make decisions, where they develop willpower. And you can see there's a energy flow going from the mid portion of his brain where he's got images of his family into this area which is powering his will. Okay, and this is getting stronger and stronger to the point where it's actually going to be a motivating factor. He's going to develop enough energy in that area after a day, a night, and a day to actually motivate himself to get up. And you can see here He's starting to get more energy up into the frontal lobes. He's beginning to focus. He's can concentrate now. He's thinking about what he's got to do to save himself. So this energy has been transmitted up toward the front, front of his brain, and it's getting quieter down here. But he's using this energy to sort of think about what he has to do, get himself going. And then that energy is sort of spreading throughout his uh, thought areas. He's not thinking about his family now, and uh, he's getting himself motivated. This is the posterior part where his muscles are going to be moving and uh, he's going to be pacing himself. His heart and lungs are going to pick up speed. So this is what I can speculate might have been going on had we been able to do a spec scan on Beck during this, uh, during this survival epoch. So here I am taking care of Beck at 21,000 feet, and uh, I felt what I was doing was completely trivial compared to what he had done for himself. It just shows you what the power of the mind can do. Uh, he was critically ill. There were other critically ill patients. Luckily, we were able to get a helicopter in to rescue these guys. A uh, helicopter came in at 21,000 feet and carried out the highest helicopter rescue in history. It was able to land on the ice, take away Beck and the other survivors one by one, and get them off to Kathmandu in a clinic before we even got back to base camp. This is a scene at base camp at, at one of the uh, camps where uh, some of the climbers were lost, and we had a memorial service there a few days later. These are Sherpas lighting juniper branches. Uh, they believe juniper smoke is holy. And uh, the climbers stood around on the high rocks and spoke of the climbers who were lost up near the summit, turning to the mountain actually to talk to them directly. There were five climbers lost here. This was. Uh, Scott Fisher, Rob Hall, Andy Harris, Doug Hansen, and Yasuko Namba. And one more climber should have died that day, but didn't. 
and that's Beck Weathers. He was able to survive because he was able to generate that incredible willpower. He was able to use all the power of his mind to, to save himself. These are Tibetan prayer flags. The Sherpas believe that if you write prayers on these flags, the message will be carried up to the gods. And that year, Beck's message was answered. Thank you.